And then with MMT generally, there's there's kind of the, this idea of, of people who really push back against the concept, who think that it's not a real thing, or that it's that it's out there or something. And I, I always I, I I think of this this meme of um, <clears throat> of you have the the guy who's maybe like a traditional economist who's saying you know no you you can't you can't do that you can't artificially inflate it you'll have a downturn you can't just start bringing out you know and then of course. The Federal Reserve just goes, ah, money printer go burr, 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 burr. <laughs> Oh, yeah, totally. <laughs> and and kind of the, one of the funny things, too, is you saw these memes go around a lot uh, in in relation to when the GameStop stock situation was going on with the, with the Reddit Wall Street bets. And, yeah, very much that was uh, like uh, the Redditors and kind of like those fringe market people were doing the things that the, that the Wall Street people do all the time. But, of course, because it was like the, the outsider people doing that, people were all worked up about that. And the... The people on Wall Street, the people in the banks, they, they understand MMT. Oh yeah, <laughs> they, they they get how this works. That that money is just a, a thing that the government creates it at will. Yep, I thought that was interesting too because one of the things that, that Richard Wolf, we, a lot of us know Richard Wolf, he says. Well, you know, I, I know that we're taught these things, um, and he's referring to people that are kind of like in control of the the American financial system because he says, "Well, I went to school like literally like, we're classmates with with Janet Yellen." So he's like, "I know exactly what she was taught. I was taught the same thing." So yeah, these this is not something that's that's new. It's something that they're aware of, and and you know they try very hard to make sure that we don't become aware of it as the general public. And these these little little figures, they have a name. We, we actually just just looked it up to remind ourselves again. But these these guys are called Wojaks. Wojak. <laughs> so if you hear the Wojak, it means it means this kind of guy, and and apparently it's also known as the feels guy. Yes. <laughs> but the Wojaks. All right. You know, a funny thing too that uh, is just going back to before when there was like the gold backed dollar is a uh, you know the, the joke is if if gold was was such this like valuable um, element then 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 why is like the majority of it sitting just in rooms and dark rooms somewhere in the basement doing nothing at all? Mm-hmm. <laughs> because in in reality it's it's not super like useful in like a materials engineering kind of way. So it's just uh, interesting how you know. Yeah, at least with diamonds. You yeah, know, they, they're really they're really hard. You, yeah. you actually have things like diamond saws, and diamond, diamond coated tools, yeah, diamond t- drills. So yeah. I guess you could have some value in that, but <laughs> yeah, I guess just one thing that that also kind of um, came into my, to my head thinking about going back to the barter economy. One thing that I think is interesting that I, I hear sometimes is a lot of people have this this miss. Um, kind of misunderstanding of this this barter economy as it used to be. Like it would be like, oh, you know, I have five cows, I'll trade you for ten pigs or whatnot it wasn't really necessarily like that so much i think that prior to prior to that the economies were were more based on and we talk about this sometimes with the idea of like the federation dollar um like how in the future in the star trek uh series and the federation credits yeah (laughs) and and so it's it's not exactly like money is being used to pay for basic human needs those are those are just provided and so that's kind of how it was in the past too instead of like barter economies what you really saw was they called them like labor-based economies where you basically um would be just part of the group by by providing your labor so it would just be like a collective idea of, of collectively people in a community are taking care of of the community's needs and instead of like being like itemized and, and charged for every single thing it would just be this based economy where you're saying like i'm providing my labor to do a service based on something that i can do and and that so you know i just like to point that out because i think that's a a a misunderstanding that people have about being the barter-based economy it's not that you need to it's not that you need to have assets to be able to trade you know it's it's that your your participation was based on you giving the services that you can do back to the society and the society takes care of itself collectively and it's not all just based on how many pieces of paper you have in your pocket right it, it was it was you know what people really need to to think about is is how our economies today are not based on on sur- the survival of all the people in the economy whereas you know going back when when you know humans were living in smaller you know sort of tribes or that kind of basis that the economy was based off of group survival and so we've come a long way away from that yeah also yeah also the the other thing i think of is a, a way that caitlin johnstone frames it and she talks about how it's rather ridiculous that whether you you live well or you, you live poorly if you're if you're rich or you're poor it depends on on how many numbers uh, are, are imaginary numbers are in your like imaginary bank account yes and it's like 
and, and we, we just, we, we just take that as real, you know, that, that, you know, that's, that's our value. That's, that's why our wealth is just what's in, what's in that bank. <laughs> It, it's it's not it's not a real thing necessarily. It's it's not. I mean, you're into, you're almost like um, the majority of like rich people's net worth is probably intangible. You know, so the way I, I like to frame it sometimes is, is is money is fake. You know, but it sure feels awfully real when you don't have any <laughs> or you don't have enough. That's very true. So then into our uh, the next question I have for you. Sure. What is the purpose of taxes? What is the purpose of taxes? Mm. Well, I mean, mm. pe- people would probably say to, to pay for, for services. Um, I don't... If we were doing Family Feud, that would come up number one. Ding! Yeah, that yeah that would <laughs> probably be like the, the real common ones. I'm not sure that I, I, I believe that, though. What, what do you think on it? Yeah, it's, um, you know, and it's one of those MMT things that when when you get to the the federal level level or more accurately when you're talking about currency issuers you you know you have the issuers versus the currency users and so if you're a currency issuer then you don't need anything (laughs) to create the currency you you do literally create it out of thin air because you can because it's it's your fiat and so this this linkage between tax dollars and the tax budget how much how much taxes are coming in is really an arbitrary construct it's um it can be useful to have kind of um to kind of have a judge of of how much money you should be making and and what may cause inflation in a in a general way but this idea of of linking it directly and having things like um pay go you know pay as you go type laws where you have to uh, reduce spending in other places to have spending elsewhere. I mean, it's it's um, it doesn't have to work that way. You know, it, it's not some some cut in stone, cut in stone thing. But it, of course, is is very convenient when they want to be uh, talking about things that they don't want to pay for, like the social programs and education and stuff and uh, medical you know, health care. Then all of a sudden it. Um, it becomes, you know, well, what's what's the budget? What's what's the comparison to the tax dollars? Whereas when it gets into other things like of course military spending and and banking and Wall Street and tax cuts, they which are a, it, yeah. a form of spending, they they just do it. Yeah. So along those lines, there's there's like I, I gotta say, like, like whenever I hear people, especially like like um, hosts on the left talk about uh tax dollars they say you know this is where our tax dollars are going i actually get a bit triggered now <laughs> because I, I you know and i just want to i just want to like like put in you know hashtag learn mmt <laughs> in there because it's and and the reason it, it isn't just because of of the academic thing of you know well that's how it actually works or whatnot but it actually has um it has consequences when 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 it's put that way you know i don't want my tax dollars going towards this or that by that logic you're actually saying then that if someone pays more taxes then they have more say in how the money is spent is is essentially what you're endorsing when when you kind of when you kind of frame it that way because if that's what taxes are for, then, you know, if, if you're paying more taxes, then you should have more influence. Yep, I definitely. And yeah, that, that, that kind of thinking also kind of breeds, I, I think, a lack of empathy because we talk about sometimes how a lot of these social programs, they're not being supported in public is, is kind of due to this lack of empathy. If you have it in your head that it's like your tax dollars, like you said, rather than just thinking of like this collective thing that's being done by the government, people will get in their heads, oh, well, you know, I don't support this. I don't want to support that with my tax dollars. But in, in reality, it's, 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 as you're saying, not like that. It's not like it's being tied to individual dollars. And of course, that's going to be a political tool that the oligarchs and the and the ruling people can can use as as weaponized against the voters and you know rile up tribal fights and whatnot and 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 you can get into things like like when when you're trying to get the rich to pay more in taxes you'll have these arguments like you know well they're already they're already paying most of the tax burden so so why should they have to pay more it's not it's not fair yeah 
So, you know, and that gets us back in, into the question again, you know, but that, so then what are taxes for? And, you know, f from my understanding of it and the way I look at it is it's about cycling the money back in is one basic, basic idea of it. You can't just um, create fiat currency and just put it out there indefinitely. It has to be cycled back in. I've heard of um, concepts of like the velocity of money of mm. it going going out and then and then coming back in and so i mean there, there's that basic concept but then there's the idea of of how do we want to tax people and there can be real purpose and intention when it comes to that um, and it gets into the wealth inequality and so if we decide that we want to have a society that um, that the wealthy people just get more and more wealthy, more wealth and more power and whatnot, then, then we kind of uh, cut their taxes <laughs> and then they, they can gather more money and the rest of the, the 99% who just have the, the, the regular taxes, then we fall further and further behind. Whereas if you have a progressive tax system, where you're actually charging um, more higher rates for people who are have more money or more wealthy, then you can actually use that as a tool to work towards the goal of, of wealth equality rather than the huge wealth inequality. And there's really there's really been a um, a real uh, I, what I call it a decades long program by the uh, the ultra wealthy to, to shift that tax burden so that it um, that's part of, of how they got wealthy that's part of how they increased their wealth um, and it's it's a real tool and and I, I think what we on the left really need to get serious about is recognizing that taxes and tax distribution are, are a tool that we should be using uh, to demand uh, progressive taxation and progressive tax systems to to claw back this wealth inequality. Yeah, and uh, also it can be a good rallying point too because as it affects the majority of, of working Americans and Americans that are going to be voting, um, you know, it's something that we can rally behind. And you see the way they do it in terms of you know these, these stories about like Amazon paying no taxes and and the and the billionaires reducing the, you know, their tax burden with every every trick in the book and in accountants and you know, whereas the ninety nine percent just keep on paying the same way, right? And it also uh, becomes an issue when you have a prioritization on like private charity and stuff like that because a lot of times what'll happen is is you know to shift blame and divert from from millionaires and billionaires going out there and saying oh we're not paying our fair tax burden they'll do big donations to charitable foundations and whatnot so this is something we need to push back on in terms of of arguing as to why we need the tax reform rather than just allowing billionaires to you know shift money through charities for that purpose yeah it's like you, you can keep your donations and pay your taxes <laughs> definitely and then it, it, it's it's about control as well because when when they're doing these donations and it's their pet projects and you got people like bill gates out there just you know just deciding you know which disease he wants to target that year you know that that's got him his interest or what pet project and you know what what we should be doing is is having a government that represents the actual people and that um is able to uh spend money you know that that benefits the 99 percent Absolutely, with the with the billionaires and the wealthy within a certain uh, part, you know, it, within a certain part of the population, there's almost this uh, obsession with them. You see that a lot with people that with Elon Musk is that you know they're going to be the billionaire savior class, and that's something that we absolutely need to be fighting against. So then the other thing um, I makes me think of is is the whole concept of the federal deficit, and you know the the, the whole concept of, of the federal deficit it, it it's like a, a monetary psyop i mean it's it's not a real thing i mean the, the the federal deficit is like it's an accounting total of just the 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 number that's the federal spending and the number that's the tax revenues now now you can decide that these need to be equal or something or you can decide that they don't um, but the, the way it gets used you know and you have like the debt clock and I mean, uh, you know, it's another thing on the left. I, I think we, we just really need to start recognizing that as a psyop, as a, 
as propaganda. Yeah, I agree. It definitely should be called out too, because really, it's one of those things that only comes up when it's convenient to the narrative that they want to push, and mm-hmm. other and other times it does not come up at all. Like if you, if you have the federal debt, you know, well, the the Fed could just print money to pay it off, or any federal borrowing is is a policy choice. It's not. It's not like, you know, it was needed or we, we wouldn't get the roads and bridges without it or we wouldn't, you know, be able to, to fund the military or something without it. It's a policy choice. And in a monetary system, I mean, you, you can have, um, you know, it does, it's not necessarily crazy to have things like bonds and that, you know, that operate as, as debt and go back and forth. But it's really down to with these policies, who they benefit, you know, who, who's, in control, who's in control of them and who... You know, are, are they are they helping with with the whole society in the ninety nine, or or are they going to the ultra wealthy on top and increasing the wealth inequality, which you see more often than not, because of course, you know, the billionaires and the megacorps at this point at this point uh, control our government, <laughs> and that's another thing we got to work on. Right, and the uh, federal deficit or federal debt will also get used as a tool uh, to push foreign policy narratives and to push for the political there's a lot of like china and russia baiting and and whatnot that goes on with with talks around the the federal debt and economy so just another uh weapon that that they can use to to continue to have the people fight about and talking about that rather than the actual issues at the root of the money and sometimes there's this idea of of, uh, uh, minting the coin have you heard that one you know mint, mint the coin and the idea is that the uh the the treasury can can mint currency of any type and of any value that it chooses and so you the 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 treasury could mint a um a trillion dollar coin and just deposit it into um into the account and then um and just spend on it right and i i think it's useful as an exercise to kind of uh get it into people's heads that this is all a game (laughs) this is all uh it doesn't have to be this whole thing of, of like a household budget where you only have so much money. Um, but you don't, you don't even really need a coin. I mean, it's just an act of Congress can just create money. Right. I mean, that's just the simple reality. I mean, sometimes people like to frame MMT like it's some, it's some plan or some weird out there theory or some policy that, that we could, you know, work towards, but it's kind of weird and whatnot. But all it really is is um is just a description of how things really work <laughs> and how federal spending really works yeah i mean money and currency itself is almost just one thought experiment <laughs> the whole thing right right you mean it's all made up it's all made up <laughs> and then in, um and then when we had the the big crash in in 2009 you really saw um how easily they created a bunch of money and and just um and just delivered it out to bail out the banks bail out the big companies the big businesses and you know you would have thought that more people should have kind of figured it out after that that um that congress that the government can create money and do what it wants with it and then now we had our our more recent you know, covid uh, pandemic crash uh, or you know downturn however it worked out you know but where they created lots of of money um one way i heard it described of is uh they basically shot a money cannon at wall street (laughs) and you know it it, what it makes me think of is that you know when you when you do that kind of money creation um it certainly can create inflation potentially and where it really created inflation was on wall street (laughs) all the stocks went up Right. And the billionaires, you know, their their profits went up. You see these these mega corporations and and they all made out. (laughs) And, you know, I think you can draw really a pretty direct connection between um, between the the federal between Congress just creating that money and those profits. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And it's it's money that's that's being created, but uh, in the public sector and going into the private sector. So that, that's money that was printed by the government to try to ameliorate an economic situation, and it's being siphoned out into private pockets constantly by the wealthy. And you had one of the things that I heard about that, that, that it's happened is that when, when we had the 2009 crash, they had to have special acts of Congress to, to kind of generate that money and funnel it out and do that stuff. 
And now, from what I've heard, the Fed is, has been empowered to, to do those kind of things automatically. This is why uh, you didn't necessarily hear, you, you don't hear a lot about what happens now because the federal bank you cre just creates a lot of money and pushes it out to the big banks, to Wall Street, and it, it, they just have to like see a systemic risk there, something like that. And I, from what I understand, to a large extent, they're, they're just empowered to do that. Whereas, of course, when it's something like healthcare or education or social spending, everything turns into a debate and, and a long process. Um, I mean, they, they couldn't even get really a, this minor infrastructure bill to really <laughs> go through with, with anything real on it. So one of the things that the MMT people I've heard talk about a lot is, is they like to tie it into a federal jobs guarantee. And one reason why that works well is when you're talking about creating this money, whether or not it'll create inflation, how it will work in the economy, the way, I, the way I've heard it described is that it, it's, it's about whether the, the, the greater economy can absorb it if there's one way I've heard it framed is that if the federal government decides it wants to employ a, like, like a whole bunch of plumbers, let's say. And so if out there in the society there's, there's not a lot of plumbers and the, and the federal government starts hiring a whole bunch, then the price for plumbers is, is going to go up because they're, they're going to get more scarce and it's a market and that's how it works. But, but if you had a situation where you had a whole bunch of unemployed plumbers sitting around looking for work or underemployed and then you hire them with federal dollars not taxpayer dollars federal dollars then it it actually is really good for the economy it gets into uh, that that money kind of uh, circulates around and you you give them jobs you get them working and it's not going to have the same kind of inflationary effect on on the the plumbers and their salaries because they weren't they weren't making plumber salaries before that. And so the federal job guarantee kind of works in a similar way in that you're, you're giving people good jobs, better jobs, you're covering unemployed people, and it's just a, a, it's just a really good tie-in to the, the whole MMT theory and that whole kind of systemic thing, and it's a way to really make that um, the system and the ability to create money to make that really work and to work for the society in general and not just for the ultra rich. Yeah, for sure. Definitely one of the things that we've talked about too on the show is is how it's a shame that in public schools you don't have a lack of, of kind of education about these topics. So what you're going on to is something that people that don't have a basic education uh, provided to them on economics, that, that is, is, is something that, that really could be, uh, could be used more. That's a good point. Mm. Because it's tricky, though, because it seems like uh, economists aren't uh, <laughs> aren't trained in a way where they they seem open to the idea of MMT. <laughs> that is a good point. I, I guess you know probably the the kind of college economics departments are, are maybe a little Need bit some reworking. Yeah, maybe a little bit kind of uh, bought and, and 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 influenced by similar how you have the the journalism mm. schools. Um, but yeah, that's a good point too. But you know some some. A fair and balanced economics education is something that definitely the, the public could use a lot more.